beautiful Snowdonia. Majestic, unforgiving, breathtaking. But look closer and you'll see the scars of an industrial past. This is slate country, and it's said that the raw, ragged material taken from these mountains roofed the world. Now, this area has fought back and has been awarded with a UNESCO World Heritage status. That struggle between man and mountain is the backbone of the National Slate Museum of Wales here in San Beres, one of Britain's oldest and possibly dirtiest industrial museums. Come with me as the past gives up its secrets and how slate changed this landscape and the people who live here forever. This museum tells the extraordinary story of how ruthless landowners shattered whole mountains to make vast profits, of terrible hardship and suffering, and one of the longest strikes in British history. The pack at the window reads, there is no traitor in this house. But there's also amazing craftsmanship. You can see the intricacy of the work. Beauty. Oh, crunch. Wow. And ingenuity. This is extraordinary. And a unique culture that flourished on the rock face. There would have been several cultural festivals of singing, poetry and performance. There were competitions for soloists, parties, poetry recitals. There's a lot of history. I feel paid. Tell me the truth. It tells the story of a people, doesn't it, of who we are. We're rooted here. Croesoi am Gyedfa Lechi Cymru. Welcome to the National Slate Museum. The National Slate Museum is housed within the old Gilvach V workshop of the vast Dinorwig Quarry, up there on Mynydd the Lydir. These workshops provided all the machinery and maintenance for a quarry that once employed 3,000 men. The quarry closed in 1969 and the museum opened three years later. So this year it's celebrating its 50th birthday. This museum itself is an artefact, a living testament to Victorian engineering and ingenuity. It's as if the workers have just downed their tools and left for the day. Life as a quarryman could be brutal, working out on the mountain in all weather, or deep underground, blasting the rock with gunpowder, hammering and chiseling out great slabs of slate by hand. This museum tells a story that is equal parts pain, protest and pride. Slate has been quarried all over Wales since Roman times, but the Industrial Revolution changed everything. As the new towns and cities of Britain boomed, there was huge demand for slate to build houses, factories and mills. And as the British Empire spread across the world, Welsh slate followed from Cape Town to Calcutta. By 1898, the peak of the industry, the slate quarries of Wales employed 14,000 men and produced nearly half a million tonnes of slate a year. The quarry owners made vast fortunes. Slate is a geological marvel, and Welsh slate is the most marvellous of all. It's ancient mud laid down on a fine strata on prehistoric seabeds and then pressed by the earth over time, some 500 million years, give or take. And it's transformed into a material so versatile and valuable that it built empires and literally moved mountains. Welsh slate is some of the oldest in the world, the most dense, the best quality, and therefore commanded the highest prices. This miraculous material is strong enough to build towns and cities and delicate enough for the finest craftsmen. Apprentices would carve fans from wafer-thin slate to show their skills with knife and chisel. Working with slate is an art and it's passed down through the generations from father to son. John Joe is a kind of living exhibit, a sixth generation quarryman 
who worked for 32 years in the Penryn Quarry and now spends his days demonstrating the craft of splitting slate for visitors to the museum. Wow. You feel the slate, don't you? So when you see a piece like this now, what's the first thing that you do? Yeah, first thing, I observe the slate, trying to find any impurities or, or faults in a way. And then I try to identify which part of the mountain it comes from. So once I've got that in mind, I know then how thick or how thin to go for. Then we start splitting, and then you start feeling and listening to that slate as well. So in a way, the slate is reacting and talking back to you. Yeah, and in Welsh, I love to say that. Because <laughs> most, most of the language in the quarries is Welsh. Yeah. Dangos i fi'n awr te, sut fysyd ti'n torri'r darn yma Yeah, so, first of all, you're going to mark it along the top. So now you're feeling and listening. And there you go. It's beautiful. So, I've got a few photos here oh, I yeah. could show you. Yeah. Well, the middle person is my great grandfather. And that's going back to 1917. Wow. He was only 17 at that time. Wow. And there's another photo of him there, hanging off the rope, trying to get the pieces of rock down. And what did he tell you about life in the quarry? Very, very hard. You were working sometimes for, for nothing because uh, you had to buy the equipment, you had to pay for your gunpowder, fuse wire. So sometimes maybe you had poor slate coming down from the mountain, so you were just splitting it and throwing it away, so you're not getting paid. Mm. But it was like a, their own community as well. So people did look after or look out for each other, shall we say. Um, can you tell me who else is in these pictures? So this little baby here is my Gates' grandfather, his father, his father, and his father. Wow. So there's four generations Four generations there. from my Gates' grandfather back. Wow. And they would have all worked in the quarry? I know three of them did. I'm not too sure on the very old. Life expectancy for a quarryman in the 19th century was just 48 years old. For me, the dust is, is, the, is the silent killer, if you know what I mean. Uh, I lost my father, uh, I think it's coming up to two years now. And that was the, the cause uh, for us losing our father because you can't see that fine, very fine dust, and that's the one that, that does the damage. Mm -hmm. uh, it carries silica, and silica, well, turns to silicosis and scars the tissue of the lung, basically. Right. So when you're here talking to visitors like myself and showing them what used to happen in the quarry, uh, what do you feel? I mean, I know it's in your DNA, but do you feel anger? Do you feel pride? No, I feel pride, tell me the truth. Angered with something, yes. Uh, but you're going back to them days, that was the culture, that was the norm. People didn't take any notice of health and safety issues and things like that. Mm. So there's a, yeah, there's a lot of history and, uh, and I'm glad I'm, I've had the chance to, to show people. Yeah. Yeah. I've always wanted to have a crack at this most traditional Welsh skill. Okay. So I'll start here. Uh, if you go to the middle first. Middle first, yeah. okay. Just a tiny tap. Yeah. I can feel it going already. Yeah. Then move it to the far end. Okay. And then back to this end. There you go. Back to the middle. There you go. Oh. And that's it. Oh, crunch. That's a very good job. <laughs> we can make a quarryman out of you yet. <laughs> It's satisfying, isn't it? It is, yeah. Diolch yn fawr iawn, I've loved it. Ideal. The museum lies on the shores of Llyn Padarn, surrounded by some of the highest mountains in Wales. It's hard to imagine anywhere on Earth where the landscape has been so transformed by the appetites of the Industrial Revolution. Whole mountainsides blasted and shattered then sold off for profit. Mm. 
The Gilvach V workshops were built in 1870, based on a plan for a British imperial fort, with a central courtyard, turrets, and a clock tower. Victorian industrial pride shines from every stone. And I'm told there's something astonishing in this building. This is extraordinary. This is the biggest water wheel in mainland Britain. It's over 50 foot in diameter. And standing underneath it, seeing the water falling on me is quite breathtaking, really. It's quite nice, actually. Quite refreshing. So this would power the workshops with an elaborate belt drive system. It's been restored now to how it was and it would power everything from the power saws to the lathes and it would gather all its power from the Avon Hoch, a stream from Snowdon just up the road. And it's a beautiful thing. Amazing to see up close and personal. So simple and yet so, so impressive. The quarries were all but self-sufficient. Almost everything you'd need for the successful and highly profitable extraction of slate could be manufactured here by a team of skilled craftsmen trained and employed by the company. In the three saw sheds, carpenters made everything from the railway sleepers to wooden mallets. In the forge, a team of blacksmiths slaved over 12 halves to hammer out the tools for the quarrymen. And in the huge foundry, workers cast complex components for wagons and machinery. Ellen Roberts, the head of the museum, tells me more. So, Ellen, this is the famous foundry. It is indeed. It's very impressive, isn't it? Yeah. So what exactly would they make here? So you'd start with a pattern, a wooden pattern made by a pattern maker. Once the patterns were ready, you'd need to heat up the metal in the furnace here in the foundry, and then the pattern would leave an imprint in the sand and the molten metal would be poured into that sand and create that, the shape that you needed. So there was tools and wheels and big things like that made here, but there was real precision to their work as well. Absolutely. The pattern maker had to be a highly skilled craftsman to be able to create all these patterns. Some of them were extremely intricate, and obviously he'd have to take into account the contraction of the metal as well. So his, when he was calculating things, his ruler would have to be one and one sixteenth rather than one inch right. to allow for that contraction. Right. And the patterns that you talk about, I mean, there's some beautiful ones on the wall. Are there many others? There are thousands. OK. Are thousands of them, and they're made by mostly three generations of the same family in Chamberis, who are called Tilly Patrum, because they made patterns. Patrum is pattern in Welsh. Wow. Shall we go and see them? Absolutely. OK. There are more than 2,000 intricately carved patterns here, used to cast everything from cogs and wheels, sprockets, rails and axles, to the unique Dinorwig windows. This is such a beautiful room. And then we have special permission to be here. That's why I'm wearing these gloves, so I can touch some of these beautiful artefacts. These are great, aren't they? Absolutely. You can see that there's a particular angle, and obviously they're made separately as well, oh, but yeah. in the end, they're going to be one piece. Right. Here's the pattern for all the windows that you see around you here. There are other patterns as well, different sizes, but you can see that the, the pattern is the same. It's quite intricate. And obviously this was, although it's extremely handsome, it was built for profit as well, because when they were blasting in the quarry, possibly a pane of glass would break and they would only need to replace maybe a small pane of glass rather than a whole pane of glass. Ellen, how important is the museum to local people? It's hugely important. You know, it's ingrained in our very souls in this community, to be honest. Um, in 69, when the quarry closed, everything was tagged and labelled for auction. And if it wasn't for one individual and a few like-minded visionaries, this place wouldn't exist today. Everything would be scattered all over the place. 
So that man here, Richard Jones, the engineer at the time, he stopped the vultures, as he called them, going on the water wheel and actually breaking it down for scrap. So that water wheel that you saw, that wouldn't be here had he not stopped them and sent them away. And 50 years on, here we are, and I'm able to show you all this. The chief engineer's house lies empty, looking out over the courtyard with its china dogs and velvet curtains. And the stores still wait for the quarrymen to come and buy their tools. It's quiet now, but you can feel the presence of the people that once lived and worked here. For me, the most moving exhibit of the National Slate Museum is Von Heil, this row of traditional workers' houses. And it tells a moving, intimate portrait of what family life was like here. The family's entire existence revolving around the industry and the company. They were struggling to put food on the table, trying to make ends meet, and trying to bring up children in the shadow of the quarry. Caddy Yolen is the museum's chief curator. Come on, Caddy. Hey, who? Dinian. Yeah, and Dioch. Tell me about this row of houses, because they weren't built here originally, were they? No, they weren't. Originally, Vron Heil was located in Tanagrishai, a small village just outside Blenafestiniog. We believe they were built in the round 1850s because they first appear on the 1861 census return. However, 150 years later, they were in such a bad state of repair that the local council was set to demolish them. So we as a museum stepped in and decided to save Ron Heil, and they were moved stone by stone here to the National Slate Museum in Llanberis. The houses have been dressed to represent family life at three of the most important quarrying districts during three different periods. 1861, Tanagrishe near Blina Festiniog the height of the industry. 1969, Llan the year the Dinorwig quarry closed. And Bethesda, 1901. I've noticed in the window there's a small placard. Can you tell me about that? Nid oes bradwr yn y tu hwn, which translates as there is no traitor in this house. And this is a really, really important artefact because it signifies that this house has been furnished to represent Bethesda during June 1901, the very, very significant date in the history of the Great Pendering Quarry Strike. Because in June 1901, the quarry reopened and around 500 quarrymen broke the strike and returned to work. As a result, the community was split in two now, the North Wales Quarrymen's Union created these signs and asked the strikers to place them in the windows. If the sign was removed from the window, it was a sign to show that the quarrymen had broken the strike and had returned to work. By 1901, the Penryn Quarry near Bethesda was one of the largest in the world, owned by Lord Penryn, the head of the powerful Pennant family. The Great Penryn Strike started with a small dispute over contracts, known as bargains, but soon simmering tensions between the men and the management exploded into a full-scale strike. In November 1900, 2,800 men walked out of the quarry, starting one of the longest and most bitter industrial disputes in British history. The strike lasted three long years and saw soldiers on the streets of Bethesda. And here we are, it's very cosy. It is. And there's a shell on the windowsill. What's the relevance of the shell? Now this shell is very important to the history of the Penryn strike. When the 500 men returned to work in June 1901, um, evidence in the local newspapers show us that quarrymen and their wives used to gather on the way to the quarry to shame um, the traitors who returned to work and um, one report says that the women used to actually blow through a shell like this to create um, a hooting noise. Wow, can I hold it? Be very careful, Hugh. don't okay. drop it. Okay, okay, okay. Wow. And so they blow through there, like a, on, the, on, the, on the doorstep. Almost like a trumpet, yes. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. And I'm immediately drawn to the stunning dresser with all the crockery on it. What's that a sign of, Caddy? 
Well, it's a sign that quarrymen weren't always poor. I think we often think nowadays, you know, that, that it, was a, it was a poor way to live. But at times, the industry was flourishing and people could make a relatively good wage. And as you see, the Welsh um, dresser just um, behind us there has the lovely willow pattern plates, a sign that they could purchase um, crockery and finery at times. This tiny house might have been home to a family of five, mother, father, three kids. But as the census returns suggest, many would also have made room for a couple of lodgers too. I mean, I, f I find it fascinating being in this house because it is so small, as you say, so many people would have lived here through good times and very, very tough times as well. That's right, it was very difficult for people um, to make ends meet. There is an upstairs here as well. Is it as small as downstairs? It is. Do you want to go and have a yeah, look? Yeah, shall we? After you. Do you come out? Wow. Tell me about the suitcase's significance, Caddy. So as you see, it's in the middle of being packed. Um, and it signifies that the father of this house was ready to move from Bethesda down to the Tumble in South Wales in Carmarthenshire to try and find work um, in the coal mines. And we actually know that around 1,500 quarrymen left Bethesda. Some emigrated as far away as America, but the majority moved down to the so South Wales coal fields just to try and find some employment in order to sustain their families. The slate industry never fully recovered from the great Penryn strike. The market found other suppliers with cheaper quarries in Spain and China. The work never returned and the industry went into a long, slow decline. The Penryn quarry dispute is still very much in the hearts and minds of people in Bethesda. Even today, some people still refuse to visit Pendrin Castle, the home of Lord Pendrin, who obviously owned Pendrin Quarry. So it really did have a long-lasting effect on the people who lived in the area. Walking around the museum, you get a real sense of how hard life was for the quarrymen in the 19th century. This was dangerous work with violent death, loss of limbs and broken bones, all occupational hazards. Living conditions were poor and ill health commonplace. You can sense the ghosts of the past lingering in the slate galleries high above and here in the workshops. But these communities were resilient too. They found a strength in unity and a unique culture grew up around the slate industry. At the heart of all of this was the caban, a kind of hut in the quarries where the men would meet at lunchtime to discuss the important issues of the day. The caban has gained an almost mythical status in the story of the slate industry, remembered as a place of culture, learning and political debate where working men could find brief respite from the harshness of their daily lives. The museum has recreated the original caban from the Gilvach V workshops. Lori Ivor is the museum's learning manager. Most cabans would have had a showiz or a president, uh, which was of course a position of great prestige, and the showiz of each caban would then dictate what was on the agenda to be discussed that day. So they may discuss anything that was going on politically at the time. There may have been discussions about theology or religion, um, but also there would have been several Eistedd uh, which are cultural festivals of singing, poetry and performance. And the bardic chair behind me is a clue as to what happened here in the caravan, is it? Yeah, so uh, that is the 1938 Eistedd chair. So there were competitions for soloists, parties, uh, poetry recitals. Uh, but of course, the highlight of every Eisteddfod is the chairing of the bard or the chief poet of the festival. Now, normally in traditional Eisteddfods, you'll see quite large and grand chairs. Um, but this chair is a little simpler, and as you notice, it's very low to the floor. This is because it was made by a carpenter here in Dinorwy Quarry, and it's styled on a blocking tin or a slate splitter's uh, chair. So it's that nice blending of the industrial and the cultural there as an artefact. Yeah, that's lovely, isn't it?
As the slate industry began to grow in the early 19th century, thousands of people moved from the Welsh-speaking heartlands to the new industrial villages in the mountains. They brought with them their language and traditions and created an environment that would nurture some of Wales's greatest writers, like Kate Roberts, T. Rowland Hughes and Caradog Pritchard. And this being Wales, a rich musical tradition evolved. Uh, another big cultural feature would have been brass bands, several brass bands dotted around the slate quarrying areas, many of which still go today and are still very successful. There were several uh, large and very successful male voice choirs. Uh, you've got some such as Cora Pendrin, which still exist to today, and I think it's been really interesting to see how choirs such as Cor Brythoniaid have performed at modern cultural events in the area, such as Festival Number no. 6 in recent years. Slate quarrying was a very Welsh-speaking industry, and that legacy is still seen today. This was, and still is, a predominantly Welsh-speaking area. There's a very famous uh, poem of which the last couplet uh, goes, Rhaid cael Cymru dorir garreg, nid yw'r graig yn deall Saesneg, uh, which means you must get a Welshman to cut the stone. Uh, the slate does not understand English. Wow, it's powerful, isn't it? In 2021, the slate landscapes of North West Wales were awarded UNESCO World Heritage status, recognising the quarries and culture that the industry left behind. You know, it's given us a bit of a buzz. Our visitors especially, they're asking questions now about the heritage of the industry, but also it gives us a sense of responsibility. We tell some of the story, obviously, of the slate industry as a whole, but now we know we have to tell the story of the Frenancha, of the Frenogwen, of Chorus. Does your museum tell more than the story of an industry and of objects. It tells the story of a people, doesn't it, of who we are. We're rooted here. So absolutely, the story of these communities that formed because of the industry is even more important than the objects that we show. The slate industry still survives in northwest Wales, but now it employs hundreds, not thousands, of men. The decline of the industry left a legacy of unemployment and hardship for many quarry communities. These landscapes are now being repurposed for a new generation of tourists and thrill seekers. The old Pendrin Quarry in Bethesda is now home to the world's longest zip line. Or you can bounce on trampolines deep underground where once quarrymen blasted slate with black powder and gathered in their cabins to recite poetry and politics. We mustn't forget the story about where this landscape came from. I've loved my time at the National Slate Museum. It's a real, live, important place that tells the story, not just of the slate industry, but of the people who worked here and who continue to live in this rugged part of Wales today. I've learned about the hardship and the adversity, but the museum is also a celebration of a way of life, of a language and of a culture that flourishes to this day.